Hey, um, I want to take you back a couple summers ago to Ferry Creek in British Columbia. On a remote stretch of Vancouver Island, a protest that's been building for months. Some consider it the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history. Their goal, they say, to stop the logging of some of BC's remaining old growth forests. More than 1,100 people were arrested as people blockaded the area, protesting logging of old growth trees in the southern part of Vancouver Island. Be gentle. Why are you men putting your hands on the life giver? This conflict, it went on for more than eight months with regular skirmishes between the RCMP and activists who were defying court orders to clear their blockades. And this wasn't just a bunch of people waving signs. You know, protesters were really deeply entrenched with the land, but also with each other, you know, twisting themselves into complex arm locks, suspending themselves high up in trees, and using all kinds of contraptions meant to slow down their arrests. They cleared protesters away, even if it did take more than eight months to do so. And after the protest ended, the BC government, it did act. It put a temporary halt on logging in several endangered old growth forests and said old growth logging was down 42%. But those specific plots of land the protesters were trying to save, they were cut down. What's more, tens of millions of dollars of public money was spent on police enforcement. Hundreds of cases had to wind their way through the courts. And with no long-term guarantee that old growth forests would be protected, you know, two years after those protests ended, the question for many activists remains, was any of it worth it? And does this kind of activism even work? So our producer, Kieran Outshorn, he was actually there in Ferry Creek in 2021, covering the blockades as the CBC's Vancouver Island reporter. And he went back there this spring. Kieran, how are you doing? I'm good, Andrew. How about you? Good, good. You know, um, so we're having this conversation right now about yeah. this protest, right, mm. at Ferry Creek. It struck me as I was walking over here to the studio that that this wasn't just any protest that, that that this must have really felt like like a battle right in, in terms of how intense it was you know even how violent it was and, and maybe even how how traumatic it was yeah un unquestionably i mean it, it was all of those things it was incredibly intense uh, throughout its duration um at times you know the reporting that we've done have shown that it was violent people did get hurt uh, people definitely put themselves in harm's way as well and and absolutely traumatic for for a lot of people involved on all sides so when we think about this question of was it worth it like how do we even begin to answer that? Yeah, it's, it's a big question, and I don't know that there's any, you know one easy answer uh, to it. But one of the places we can start is by thinking about what people were actually fighting for, uh, sure. these old growth forests. And I don't know if you've spent any time in any of these forests, no, no, no. but they're frankly, they're a little magical. You know, these trees, they're massive. It takes 10 people holding hands just to reach around them, and, and they rise into the sky. It's it's calm, it's quiet. You know, in, in the morning, the, the mist rolls in off the ocean and it's, it's really tranquil. It was sort of this, this, you know, this, this rare ecosystem. This is what these activists were fighting for. Activists like Will O'Connell, who is a 31-year-old biology teacher uh, from Machosa, just west of Victoria. I, I, I met him a few times out uh, in the protest. And during the protest, he and a bunch of his friends, they were in this place called the Kaikus Valley. And they were in these tree sits, high up in the trees. And the idea was that if the tr people were in the trees, the, the loggers couldn't cut them down because it was you know unsafe to chop them down. But the police came in, in helicopters, uh, in rappelling gear, and they, they managed to pull all the people out. Wow. And these areas, specifically in the Kaikus, were active cut blocks. And so once they got the protests out, all those trees were cut down. So we went from this, you know, incredible, beautiful sort of old growth forest uh, to cut blocks. And Will, he hadn't been back in two years. And so this spring when I went back, I went back with him to see what it was like. And his reaction was really compelling. This is, this valley was, it was like a, an amphitheater of old growth all the way around. And, and you walk through it and there's these huge cedars on the, on, in the valley on the other side. 
And then on this side, there was this unique little patch of ancient firs running up this bank. And from here, you can see everything that's happened. That must have been really something for him to, to be there in that same space that he would have remembered so well, except it looks nothing like what he remembers. Yeah, it's, it's completely changed. So one of the things that I talked with Will about was about how he wanted their protest to be more than like a symbolic stand. They were trying to protect these trees, you know, the, the ones that they were in. And going back with him, uh, and, and when he saw that they had all been cut down, it was really, really defeating. It, it, you, you could see it in him. I think I'm, all, I'm always shocked coming back to forest, even when you knew that it was gonna happen. You're always shocked to see how the landscape you forget. When I came around that corner, I saw something that I, I had no memory of. Like I remember this whole place so well and I can't see a single thing I recognize, but I know I'm standing in the same place. And it's this bizarre, you, like you feel lost. You know, so it seems like the, the answer to the question, are, are, are forests like this worth preserving? I mean, that, that, that seems actually like quite an easy question to answer. But these protesters, I mean, they, they, they sort of went to hell and back in trying to defend it, right? That there was a real material cost. And they put themselves in material danger, mm. not just opposing police, but, but as you say, these tree sets, right? That perching themselves high in trees where, where they could have been, been hurt. That must have, I guess, even if you look back, you know, now or years later, they must look back and say, no, there, there was a cost to pay there. Uh, there was, and and it, it's you know that was part of the reporting that I was doing on this trip was trying to understand a little bit of that. I mean, uh, as much as maybe we can sympathize with maybe the actions that uh, that maybe some of these people felt like they were taking, what, what they were doing was illegal. Uh, wasn't something that uh, was technically allowed. And more than a thousand people ended up being arrested. More than four hundred charges were laid. And uh, you know people are still being pulled through that legal system, which takes years. It's grueling to pull through. And that was the case for this woman I spoke to named Angela Davidson. Uh, otherwise known as Rainbow Eyes. She's a member of the Denakdao Awaitlala First Nation, and she was a, a, a really active presence on the blockade. Today, a period of calm, but activists say this is far from over. I mean, the people here are here to... Um, the roots are growing here. She got arrested five times, huh. and at least one of them, she, she accused RCMP of violently dislocating her knee during that arrest. And her trial uh, hasn't concluded yet, but she's already faced a lot of really serious restrictions on her, on her movement, I mean, costs to her life. And so she's been locked in, uh, in terms of not being able to move around, and those consequences have just dragged on and on. I kept going back to court and I not knowing what it was for, but I was called in because they have set dates. They have like ones you just have to appear and, and they set a date for next time. And then you go for the next one and it's just to set a date for the next time. Yeah, because you're saying that her, her legal woes aren't done yet. That's right. still ongoing. Yeah, no, that's right. So she is, uh, her trial started this month, but uh, as has happened before, it's got pushed back again. So now, uh, even though it started, it got adjourned to September. Um, so, you know, she's still hanging on, on what's going to happen next. I wish I could do more to prepare, but like, I don't know what to do. Um, like, I couldn't even get an Indigenous law specialist paid by legal aid because they said it would cost over $100,000. So they set us up for failure. The system is not set up to help indigenous people. It's meant to protect industry and the government. There was also quite a divide 
you know, within and among indigenous communities themselves. Mm-hmm. Because th- there was, there, not that there ever is, but there, there was not any one single homogenous uniform point of view yeah. on how these protests should unfold or if they should unfold at all. Yeah, well, it's important to think, like any community, any family, people don't always get along. Um, and these protests, they happen primarily on the traditional territory of the Pachydat First Nation. And there were some people from that community who were supportive. But other community members opposed the plan to keep cutting old growth. You don't cut down the forest, honey. You leave it up and you go there and pray and meditate. There was an elder named Bill Jones, very vocal, very supportive of the of the protesters. Uh, you know, like did a call out asking people to come. But on the other hand, uh, the elected chief of the community, Jeff Jones, uh, he uh, was opposed, uh, and 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 the council uh, at the in the community was opposed to the protest. They put out statements asking the protesters to leave, and and you know recognizing and reaffirming uh, some revenue sharing agreements that they'd made with the logging company. Right, because to some extent they benefit from the logging that was going on there. Yeah, that's right, and and it's it's worthwhile to remember that this is a relatively small community, the Patchy First Nation, two hundred members, a little bit more than that. So a small community but differing points of views within it. Let's talk about the logging company Mm. that was involved. I mean, there there would have been great cost to them as well, presumably. I mean, can you tell me about that? Yeah, that's right. So the logging company uh, is called Teal Jones. Uh, No relation to Jeff or Bill. (laughs) Okay. Um, It's a family-run... you know, timber harvesting company. It's based in Surrey uh, on the mainland, uh, and they have the rights to harvest crown timber in this area. It's called uh, Tree Farm License 46. Um, and, you know, as much as the activists had their lives turned upside down because of this protest, the, the logging company says that they've lost a lot of money. In, in court documents that they put before uh, the Supreme Court in BC, they said that the activists were, were affecting uh, their legal right to harvest timber to the tune of about $20 million. And, and they've said that, that you know, over time, uh, that's continued to compound. So, so the beginning of the blockade was a couple of years ago, but it, it manifested itself for, for an extended period of time to the point where we were, we were um, set back even last year in our harvesting opportunities. Um, it's funny how large-scale protests will discourage certain contractors from coming to work for a company. The, our number one thing for the injunction when we went and put it was to try to keep our employees safe, to be able to go and harvest uh, what we were legally allowed to harvest and that we had agreements with First Nations in the province to go and harvest. So beyond the, the business ramifications, Brown actually says that uh, they have concerns, they, they had a more serious allegation about safety for their staff. They were saying that the activists had been tree spiking. That's what their allegation was. And what does that mean? Yeah, so that's when you take a, a, a like a steel nail and you, you drive it deep into a tree so that if it gets logged, then it'll cause damage to the logging equipment. We have pulled numerous logs out of our log inventory uh, that had been spiked. In our opinion, it, there was a near fatal, uh, could have been a fatal catastrophic uh, damage done to the saw, destroyed the saw, and our Sawyer was standing right beside the saw. The only, uh, and I don't say this lightly, it was, it was literally uh, by pure luck that something major didn't happen to that individual. Um, and that was extremely disappointing. We know exactly where the log came from. And uh, we know that it was definitely spiked. Do we know if that, if that actually indeed happened, was that protesters who were doing that? So I, I asked the RCMP if they were looking into this. And they told me they did open an investigation into tree spiking uh, around where the protesters have been. But, but no charges have been laid. I also put that question, though, to one of the key organizers of the organization that was kind of helping run the protest, the Rainforest Flying Squad. I'm not saying that didn't happen because it, it was a wide open blockade. Anyone could have come to do whatever their little gorilla heart desired. Like, it's not, we can't, I can't control anything. No one else is the boss of anything. So I would be surprised if that was true, but... Obviously, we don't want to hurt anyone. That's not, it goes against everything we're trying to do, right? But I don't believe it. Now, while Knight was skeptical that her fellow activists would do something as dangerous as tree spiking, she did say that she could sympathize or at least understand uh, the motivations behind wanting to destroy logging equipment. It's hard not to fantasize and dream about doing something that would actually cause financial harm to the companies that are 
like thrusting us into this climate crisis, right? It's hard not to to dream about, you know, blowing up machines and, you know, whatever. But we always agreed we would never do that. And, you know, it's kind of like honor, you know, to stick with that kind of that program. But I, I really, I do have to say, it's definitely crossed my mind as it probably has lots of people's minds. Like, how are we going to take this down? Like, how can we stop this? Putting our bodies on the line wasn't enough. So, you know, we, we talk about danger, and, and it makes me think of the police response. Yeah. I mean, th- there were a lot of RCMP officers there yeah, yeah. in this protracted battle between them and protesters. Not only a potentially dangerous situation, but, but a costly one, yeah. given how much was involved. Yeah, so more than eight months, the, the enforcement took place over, and there was helicopters, there were vans, there were tens of officers there every single day, heavy machinery trying to dig people out. It cost a lot of money. I remember when I was out there reporting, being like, holy smokes, like, I can't wait till we actually figure this out. And CBC News, through access to information, was able to find out that police spent more than $19 million on enforcement operations wow. in and around Ferry Creek. And, you know, like, that's, that's a ton of money. So, so where do we land after all of this? Because if we're asking the question, you know, was all of this worth it, you consider the material harm to protesters, Mm -hmm. to the logging company, certainly, and and maybe even to taxpayers, given the cost involved in policing. So so what's the bottom line here? Well, it's hard to draw a a, a clean and, and simple bottom line. I mean, there have been some changes to policy. NBC is honoring a request from three First Nations to defer the logging of old growth trees in two areas of Vancouver Island. It'll be stopped there for two years. The B.C. government, at that very height of the protest, actually deferred logging in specifically uh, the Ferry Creek watershed, like at the very heart of where the protests were. So not all the areas they are protesting, but in one specific area. Uh, And actually, just this month, uh, that deferment was set to end, but they extended it uh, until 2025. Mm. Um, The B.C. government has also gone about uh, doing deferments. These are temporary pauses on on logging and old growth, another like 2.1 million hectares uh, across uh, the province. So, uh, you know, they would say that they're taking quite a lot of action. Unfortunately, neither side, uh, the protesters or or the loggers, are particularly happy. The protesters say these are just delay tactics. These aren't permanent protections. They they don't go far enough. And the the logging company says that you know the way this is slowing down their business is actually killing their business model. So neither side is really happy. And so those protesters then that you've spent so many months and over a period of years talking to, how how do they feel about all of it at the end of the day? Yeah, well, so that was the question that I was trying to go out there and to really get an answer to. And, and talking to some of these people, like Knight, who we were talking about earlier, uh, she felt really ground down. She was there from day one. And, and you know, all this time later, um, you know, it, it was something, you know, just engaging with how much effort this has put in was something that, like, you know, had really beaten her down. I felt like, you know, what did we do? Why did we do this? We put everyone in danger and we encouraged people to come and do this and... And they just got beat up. And and we actually didn't even get any permanent protections put in on those forests. We raised a lot of hell. And I don't know if we really accomplished what we intended to. I asked her if, you know, given everything that she knows now, if she would go do it all again. And her response really surprised me. I mean, had you talked to me last winter, I definitely would have said, I will never do that again. It was a complete nightmare. I don't want to put people in harm's way, like ended up what, that's what happened, you know? And I I don't know how we can avoid that, but we've got to do something. Okay, so was this worth it? I think my reporting has shown that this remains a a deeply conflicted issue. You know, both sides, all sides, you know, from the taxpayers to the logging company to the activists have racked up losses. But, you know, there's, there's so much that's still at stake and people still feel so passionately about it. I think it's going to continue to be something that people are focused on going forward. Hmm. Kieran Outshorn, thanks for your reporting on this. Yeah, anytime.